name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Trudy and Keith Kramer at Kramer Vineyards in Gaston. It's June 24th, 2020. Thank you both for joining us Absolutely. today. You're welcome. And we'll get rolling again. Why wine? Uh, uh, we were interested in wine uh, back in our college days. Uh, uh, we enjoyed wine. A little bit here, a little bit there, but uh, you know, it was a beer culture. But but we were always interested in wine, and um, uh, I had a, I was in a five year program, so our fifth year after we were married, uh, we made a little bit of wine in our apartment, and then uh, uh, you know just playing around, and then uh, after graduation um, we got busy with with work and stuff, but then uh, uh, we moved to a little community of Warren uh, between Scappoose and St Helens and had some property so we planted some cane berries and uh, from that uh, uh, we started making a little bit of wine then we thought oh, let's try a few grapes so we added a few grapes to it pretty soon our, our uh, small acreage was you know almost a half acre of fruit that we were making wine out of and uh, some of it was good and some not so good but uh, um, it's a learning curve <laughs> yeah so when you're a, a Trudy uh, uh, was talked to entering uh, raspberry wine at the county fair and lo and behold she got the best to show so they talked her into, into entering it at the state fair lo and behold we got the best to show at the state fair <laughs> uh, so from that uh, Trudy started making many different wines uh, yeah the first one that we ever made was orange wine because it was January and this book that I had from this guy called H.E. Bravery. He's from England. And he had, it was making wine out of a whole lot of different things. It wasn't just wine out of grapes. It was wine out of, you know, flowers and potatoes and <laughs> raisins. And then a combination of anything. I mean, it was amazing. And a lot of berry wines, a lot of fruit wine. And so I found it to be quite interesting. And the thing about the orange wine that was interesting was that he recommended that you that you take the skin and actually massage it to get the the um, to get the um, uh, oil out of it, which would help with the flavor of the of the eventual wine. And um, so my first gallon was orange wine. It was pretty good. I was surprised. And and then when then we really kind of got more into it when we got into the when we lived in Warren and um, was making a lot of berry wines. And it just so happened that Keith has family that grows berries, and so we got some starts from them. And we had like Logan berries, raspberries, blackberries. Actually, actually, I think we had. Do we have Cascade? And Marion berries. Current. Red currant. <laughs> And so we had all these berries that we were growing and making wine out of because you can only make so much jam and jelly and then you just, <laughs> I mean, you have to do something with it, right? <laughs> so I pulled the book out and started making wine. And a raspberry wine entered at the county fair. It's this county that's so small you could see everybody that's there. Mm -hmm. I think there were a total of like eight or nine entries in the entire wine, you know, department <laughs> there. And so, yeah, it was fair. It was kind of scary because they said oh you should enter the state fair and I'm going really isn't that kind of like for a big cheese or something you know and when I was really shocked when we got the best of show um, and then from there we started continuing to make a lot of like you said a lot of different wines then we actually realized they're growing wine grapes in Oregon mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that happened was that um, in 19 80, I actually took a wine tasting class from Matt Kramer. Wow. Yeah. And the funny part about it was I started ta I signed up for the class and then I found out I was pregnant with my son, my son Mickey, our second child. And so I, I couldn't, I didn't swallow anything. I spit everything out. And, you know, everybody was feeling sorry for me. And I was not really feeling that sorry for me, especially when we got to the Burgundy section because he's pulling stuff out of his cellar in his home and it's stuff that you probably couldn't buy and so he did this whole class on burgundy and the very last wine was this amazing i think it was domaine romani conti and and i was just so stunned by this and see everybody else had been drinking the wine i hadn't so I was able to really realize how good this wine was. And it's like, wow, I can actually make something like this in Oregon. And I went, whoa, 
you know, that's, that's just kind of this re revelation mm -hmm. that occurred mm -hmm. that, was, um, that was really a big thing. Mm -hmm. And so then we decided, we went into a period of time where there wasn't really, there was an economic downturn, especially in Columbia County. And Keith was, he's a pharmacist by trade, and he was running a couple of pharmacies in Scappas and St. Helens. And you know, there's not a lot of wine grapes being grown there. And so we were, are we gonna spend the rest of our life here, which we could do? Because we, we had a nice home, we were out in the country, we enjoyed what we were doing, he enjoyed his job, you know, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but, but the economy was going downhill and we're like, well, should we actually be looking at being in the wine industry or not? And we got in touch with a, with a wine grape grower called Jim Layden, who is up in Banks. Courting Hill. Courting Hill Vineyards, yes. And he sold wine grapes to a lot of amateur winemakers. And it was kind of like one-stop shopping, only you just kept coming back to the same place. Because he would call you and say, well, this is ready, and then that's ready. We would go grab the kids, go, go um, pick grapes. And he had a destemmer crusher and, and a press. Um, and and uh, so, you know, we were able to um, process the fruit and then take it home and actually make the wine. So uh, we had all sorts of fermentation going on in our house, <laughs> sometimes in the bathroom, in the, in the tub, sometimes, you know, out in the garage, you know, it's just kind of all over the place, Look, the kitchen, whatever. And um, I would enter, you know, eight to ten wines every year at the, at the amateur wine competition, and they kind of got to know, well, she's entered another wine here, you know. So when we bought this place in 83, we bought it, we'd actually looked at a couple other places and one of those was, um, was what became Kings Ridge. Mm -hmm. The other one was Laurel Ridge. Um, and, um, and that was, um, the, uh, the house needed a foundation. There was this really ugly, really old building that was like one story that had blackberry brambles going inside of it and they were saying, oh, you could make a tasting room out of this. And I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> and so we decided that we really weren't interested in, in and then the vineyard was, it was this very wide spacing that nobody spaces with anymore because it was one of the first vineyards in the state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were doing California spacing. Mm -hmm. And nobody was doing that here anymore. I mean, it was like, you know, that wasn't it. In 1984, um, it was amazing because that was the first year they came out with the Oregon Wine Grape Growers Guide. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and they also, was it was a class in winemaking that Rich Cushman taught at Clackamas Community College. Keith took a class in Dundee um, from the guy at Erath. Uh, yeah. Uh Hol Hol Holstein. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Holstein. Al Holstein. And we've got a picture of Keith and Mickey out in the vineyard during one of those classes, so it was kind of cute. But um, so I met Barish Cushman for the first time at that class, and he recognized immediately that I, how serious I was about what, what I was doing, and so it was kind of neat. Um, and we bought the place in '83, and mainly because it was next to Elk Cove, mm -hmm. it was in Yamhill County, and that's where we wanted to be. Um, it was uh, actually not actually identified as being a grape growing property. Mm -hmm. And it had been um, purchased by a couple that has um, a, um, that had a Thai restaurant, we think so because their name was Thai. Um, and they owed this company a bunch of money and so they decided they had to sell the property in order to pay, pay their money back to this, you know, this company. And, and so uh, they just wanted to unload it. And, but the problem was they didn't have, didn't know where the boundaries were. So, so we, we put in the earnest money. I had been in real estate for a short period of time, so I knew you had to know where the boundaries were. So we put in the earnest money that we had to find the boundaries. Well, this was a little bit harder than nobody up here had ever surveyed this whole hill. So they had to go down to this rock right off Highway 47 and work their way up through forest and it took them two weeks to come through the forest and figure out actually where our property line was. And it ended up costing several thousand dollars, which at that time was quite a bit of money. I think it was, I think it was more like eight or nine thousand, something like that. 
Yeah, 10 maybe. It was a lot of money. And, but everybody else up here was thrilled <laughs> because now they had a points from which to start to figure out where their property lines were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, was, that was kind of interesting. And, and we bought the property in May of, of 83, I think. Right? It seems like it was mm -hmm. May. And so we, we, didn't feel, we felt we had to work on the property first before we planted, and we didn't plant until 84. And we planted 2,000 vines, a little bit of Pinot, a little bit of Chardonnay, and a little bit of Riesling, kind of, you know, the equal amounts. And one of the most fascinating, I think Kim must remember this too, the fascinating time was we, we actually commuted from our home in, in, in uh, um, in Warren for five years before we actually moved into this building and lived here for a year while we were building the house and getting the winery licensed. And so, uh, but in the meantime, we, this was like we called it our barn dough. It's a condo in a barn. And so we come up here and if the weather was crappy, we have a place to go. You know, we actually had toilet facilities and we had, you know, we had, we had a little kitchenette area that we kind of set up. So it, we, we had, it was a comfortable spot, you know, we had beds and everything. So, um, but we came up one time, and I think it was in August, and all the plants had been growing really nicely, you know, and they all had little leaves on them, and we went around the corner, and all the leaves were gone. And we're like, you could have heard a pin drop in the car, because it was so shocking to see no leaves. The deer had eaten them. So the deer them. had been active. Yeah. So that was our first, uh, you know, experience with deer. <laughs> it wasn't a good one. The plants did not die. They just, it just sets them back. Mm -hmm. And they have to grow, you have to grow, in order for the roots to grow, the leaves have to grow. So it just sort of, they stopped until they started growing more leaves. And then, you know, so it, uh, so it took a, a little bit longer. We did, we did not use irrigation. We actually watered by hand to get the plants going. And we didn't really have the water. We had a, a, a well that's only five gallons a minute. So, you know, it's some water, but it's not very much. <laughs> so, um, so that was it. And, um, and we are beginning. And we kind of did that uh, for the first four years, did about 2,000 plants a year. And um, we finished off the Chardonnay. We finished off the Pinot in this vineyard over here. Then we started planting Pinot Gris and Mueller Turgau. And those were our um, grapes that, that are basic, I guess you'd call them our big five at mm -hmm. the time. Um, and, um, and, so, and it, it, so we would plant every year just a little bit. We'd always be rooting something. And then 1990 rolled around. And in 1990, we went to this conference. And there were, there were um, the big thing was they discovered phylloxera in every region of Oregon. Mm -hmm. So that means a huge change. That means, well, now we can't own root our vines and plant vineyards. We have to do grafting, have to graft grafted vines, which is, um, which was a phenomenal change. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then um, the other thing that happened was uh, Barney Watson did a test on in 1984 was also the first Cool Climate Viticulture Seminar in McMinnville. Mm -hmm. That no, it was in Eugene. Excuse yeah. me. And um, and it it was it was an amazing thing to go to this because I never forget Myron Redford was sitting at this table arguing with chemists about how to reduce acid in wine, and we were just kind of sitting there going, whoa. <laughs> We're the newbies, you know. This is really interesting, <laughs> and so um, though that was a phenomenal experience to do, to to go to that. And um, but uh, Barney had received some some of the Dijon clones of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay at that time, and of course they had to plant them at Oregon State and kind of get them to grow and kind of make sure they don't have diseases and all this. It was in quarantine and blah 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 blah. And so he, and part of that was that he was able to make wine out of these and actually to compare them with the old clones of Pinot or Chardonnay, and, um, especially the Chardonnay, because the Chardonnay ripens much earlier than the old one away clone that most people had. There was one away in Draper, and then somebody told me there's actually two one away clones. But, um, but anyway, they, uh, he was able to um, make wine out of this, and we were there when he actually poured it for everybody. 
and there's been very few times I've been in a in a room of people drinking wine and it's quiet mm -hmm. but you could just feel the energy in the room as people tasted this Chardonnay that was from these new clones and the Chardonnay that was from the 108 clone and how different that was and how much better it was mm -hmm. especially in a year where you didn't have a very good very much heat in your your uh, vintage and and so it, that was the beginning of a big change with Chardonnay I think it was basically a change from putting up with 108 because that's what we had and and really either ripping it out or grafting it over and putting in a Chardonnay that we actually was much more suited to us mm -hmm. so you know I really have to be very thankful that the industry in in Burgundy came up with this mm -hmm. because it was a huge change for us in Oregon and I like to tell people that with the 108 clone you would have this huge diversity of quality where you'd just be going really good quality when you had a lot of heat and then not such a quality in here and then a really good quality and, and, the, and the Dijon clones are more like this. You know, so you have this more consistent over whatever the vintage throws at you because it ripened so much earlier. So that to me was another um, really big step and the fact we also got a whole lot more clones of Pinot because we only had three to start with and uh, which we had a little bit of everything we didn't have much of Aidensville we had mostly Pomard and then we had um, Gamay Beaujolais upright clone a little bit of that but mostly Pomard and then um, I, w I talked to a French guy I said so if you I went to a seminar and I said so if you could plant any of the Dijon clones of Pinot which would you plant and I said you know what are they planting in Burgundy? He said 115. I said, thank you. Because, you know, I was like, what do you pick when you really are not sure about what to do? And um, so that's how we got in on getting some more clones in the vineyard. And uh, 115, and we got 777, and then 667. And, and then um, we had Riesling in the vineyard, and when it got to selling the Riesling, that was a different story uh, because we had Riesling and we had Miller Turgau. People would come in the tasting room and they would go. So, that Riesling, I know what that is, but what's that M wine? Mm -hmm. And so they would be interested in tasting that and they would buy that regardless of the fact that one of his parents was Riesling. Mm -hmm. And so it was very, very interesting that, that at that time, you know, we had this Riesling vineyard right by the winery and yet we were having trouble selling the wine. And so we ended up um, grafting that over to Mueller Turgau. So you go out here, you see Mueller Turgau, but the, but the rootstock is all Riesling. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much in our vineyard is, is own rooted. We have a lot. Oh, we're about 50 50. 50 50? Yeah. So we do have a lot of own rooted. Um, and that's because when, everybody, when we started, that's what everybody did, you know? And it's very easy to root a vine. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, at that time, there was no phylloxera in our area. Um, and then I got to thinking about California. California, the vineyards that didn't get it were the ones that were more isolated. So that was another issue was, okay, so it's a lot more expensive to put in these grafted vines. Yes, we have to plant grafted vines, but you know, the chances of us getting phylloxera right now, probably not so good. And if we're not sharing any um, equipment with people, with other vineyards and stuff, and uh, we were sharing some workers with another vineyard, but not equipment. Mm -hmm. And so those are all some of the big issues. Am I missing anything in those early years, really? And when we started, it was 57 wineries in Oregon. Yeah. We were number 143. And the Abbey is 146. <laughs> so the Abbey started the same year we did. Which was, which was another thing that's very interesting. In fact, before they started, they come and asked us if we would be interested in storing wine uh, with them. And we said, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. And so we're, we're also one of the first customers for Signature Mobile Bottling. We started using them in 1990, and we've used them every year except for 2010 vintage because that was such a low number. We had very few um, cases to bottle. Mm -hmm. But every other year, we've used them either once or twice a year. So uh, we were very well known with them as well. And, and it was kind of funny, they say, we like coming here because things go really well. I said, really? He said, oh yeah. I says, you wouldn't believe what happens at other places. <laughs> and he said, we had this one guy tell me I should teach a class on how to, how to mobile bottle. 
you know, from the winery stand standpoint, what you have to do to, to do that. Because it's very complicated. And you have to be organized. You have to get everything there at the same time. You have to get all your people. You have to have enough people. You have to have people that are willing to work hard for a day. So our so, vineyard's growing now from um, those original 2,000. We have about 22, 23 acres of grapes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the latest plantings have been uh, uh, aimed a little bit more at uh, uh, grapes for the sparkling program. We, we, uh, we've developed a nice, uh, nice area there for the traditional and a carbonated. And what we did was we had um, in um, 2010, we uh, traded land with a neighbor. And they wanted this land because they wanted to put trees on it. And we wanted that land over there because we wanted to plant grapes. And so it was a real nice change. Uh, you know, it was a really nice piece of property, too, that we got. We we're very happy to see that. And that was about the time that Kim came on board and wanted to do Pinot Meunier for, for sparkling. Um, we should probably talk about sparkling and how we got into that, huh? Please. Okay. Uh, uh, so the first sparkling was done in... Well, we had we had a we had a huge crop of Mueller Turgau yeah. in 2001, and Mueller Turgau is like that. It's very productive, and you can get this huge crop and go, oh, you know, what are we going to do with all of it, you know? And and um, so, what, what are we going to do? What year was it? 2001. So 2002. 2002. Uh, we're trying to figure out what to do, and I said. You know, Mueller Turgau is kind of light. It isn't a real strongly flavored wine. It might be a good sparkling wine, but I don't want to do Method Chef and Wasco. That's too hard. But I know somebody that does carbonated wine. So I got in touch with uh, Jim Wasson at Wasson Brothers, and he agreed to do a batch of, of carbonated wine for us. He had, what, 55 cases, something like yeah, that? Yeah, he, he's smaller than we do. Smaller than we do. We do 65 at a batch now. But um, So anyway, so he did that. It sold really well. The next year he did two batches for us. It was about a hundred cases that time for the two batches. And it sold so well, the next year we actually bought equipment. So 2004 is the first year we actually made carbonated wine ourselves. And so Keith is really good at tinkering with things. So he was trying to figure out how to, how to get as, as many bubbles in there and nice bubbles. Because we have we heard about, oh, you don't want to do carbonated because the bubbles are big. Well. There's a ways of working with that so you have smaller bubbles that so you don't. And so many people come in and taste our carbonated wines and they don't even realize they're not Method Champenoise because the bubbles are small. It's, it's really fun. <laughs> I've had people who, shouldn't, who probably should know the difference tell me that they really like that sparkling Gruner. Um, so we, we started out doing sparkling Mueller and then we went to Pinot Gris. So we added that Pinot Gris after and, a few years. And a rosé. Right, a rosé. Yeah. We had a cat staff and person then, that liked rosé, and so you should do a rosé. And Kim uh, 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 came online uh -huh. and got us uh, started in Brut uh, in 2008. 2008 is when she started, and I think 2009 was her first Brut. Um, and then she, besides planting Pinot Meunier, we ended up also planting Gruner. And so we get to the point where we get, where, we're going to, pick our Gruner for the first time. Kim goes out there, she goes, this is gonna all be sparkling. And we're like, really? <laughs> so we made it carbonated Gruner for the first, what, three years? Um, because it was a, a small vineyard that was coming into production, but you know there wasn't that much there. And she felt that nobody in Oregon was doing a sparkling Gruner, so maybe that's what we should do. Kind of set ourselves apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it was a very popular wine. We had a lot of people really enjoy that sparkling Gruner. So it wasn't until 2007 that we actually had enough grapes to do a still wine. And now, and in, in the vineyard, 17, excuse me, 2017, that's correct. And, um, but the 2017 vintage was our biggest ever. Uh, and so we were trying to figure out where to put everything. But, um, but it was, um, it was, it was, so that was kind of momentous in a way. Um, and, uh, and, and then we, uh, that, then once we got the brute going, uh, uh, I mean, Kim did it here for a few years by herself. They did it by hand without a lot of equipment. And, uh, boy. You're talking about the work was amazing and the loss work. was amazing and it was just like. So then, uh, in, what year did they start down in McMinnville, 15? 
So in 15 is when the, uh, uh, they opened up the uh, radiant. 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 Yeah. So we do all the, all the uh, we put the wine together, make, make the uh, base wine. And bottle it. Um, uh, eight, uh, yeah, put it into the bottle for the secondary fermentation and then we ship Call it down to Radiant. Or to the Abbey. To the Abbey to store it. And, and then, then they'll take it to Radiant when we need it to, worked on and then, so, yeah. And that's so what they wonderful. They've done the finishing part, which um, they have the equipment for and we don't. And they had his rate of success as far as you know, how much do you have when you start and how much do you have when you actually finish was much higher than what we were doing here. So it made sense for us to, to take that jump. But also we were going from maybe 100, 150 gallons, or I'm mean, not gallons, um, cases of sparkling. We we're going up to two and 300. Mm -hmm. So you're getting to in, into this higher volume that you really can't afford the time to bottle it by, I mean, to, to finish it by hand. It's just too hard. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they came on board at a really great time for us, and we had them um, finish a whole lot of wine for us the first year. I think it was 300 cases. No more than that. Okay. We were his biggest customer. He, he said, no, it was 1,000, wasn't it? He said we were his biggest customer. <laughs> I went, great. <laughs> this little tiny winery is their biggest customer. <laughs> but... Um, so, th so that's been really interesting, mm -hmm. and watching all that, and um, of course we, we try to our focus on, on on the wine. We've always been focused on selling, as far as marketing goes, selling directly to customers. Yeah, we sell about was about eighty five percent through the taste room, Kim. Yeah, about eighty five percent through distributors or do personal so. accounts that we have. But it's uh, it's it's a real tough business getting into that distribution side. And we felt with the size of winery that we had that we should probably look more at, at selling direct to people. And so from the very beginning, we wanted to provide people with our philosophy was, you, first of all, you have to make pretty good wine, number one. But you also provide them with a nice experience so that when they come and they enjoy the wine, they enjoy the experience, they bring back their friends and family. They come back again and again and again. And then at some point, um, we realized we needed to have a wine club and we started in on that, um, gosh, when was that? In the 1990s sometime, I think. And um, we went to a seminar and they said a third of your sales should be wine club. And I went, oh. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like, well, I guess we have to change what we're doing now. And, uh, and we started to grow um, our, our wine club. And uh, we were doing a lot of marketing here, but we also did a lot of wine festivals. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, we um, decided we weren't going to do wine festivals anymore. Our wine club had grown to the point where we felt that we didn't have to do them. Mm -hmm. And um, we hadn't been open in January and February, and we decided to be open in January and February in 2008. That was when we had all that, um, was it the 15th of December? It started snowing, and it kept snowing all the way through the end of the month. And so we couldn't be open then. And we did pretty good sales the last part of December. So that was kind of a bummer. And um, so then we thought, well, we should be open in January and February because we weren't open in December very much. So that was kind of the beginning of changing our hours and not being closed in January and February, and actually being open. And we actually did better than if we'd gone to the wine festivals. So, you know, it was a great decision. <laughs> So, um, well, another thing that we haven't mentioned is that we did make berry wine for a while. Mm -hmm. We started out, we made berry wine until 89, or in, excuse me, 99 was the last year. We, we decided we're not going to make it anymore. And some of that was because the berries were getting more expensive, and we didn't know how much we could get for the wine. People remembered us for the berry wines and not for the grape wines, which was just weird, because they come here and they see all this vineyard, and, and, and yet they remember you for the berry wines. And it's like, well, if we don't do berry wines, they won't remember us for the berry wines, will they? There's still people that come in our taste room and go, I remember when you made that really good raspberry wine. You know, it's kind of like, but, you know. Um, we should go back on the history of the winery a little bit. Okay, what? You kind of missed the start of the okay, winery. Okay, oh, the start of the winery, we did. <laughs> well, your storytelling's not needed here. We can tell it in New York. Okay, okay. So, um, but anyway, uh, we started out, we opened in 1990. So our first vintage was 89. 
think we, we had five barrels of Chardonnay and, and five, five barrels of Pinot. Pinot and we just put them in right here and people would come and say, that's our entire production of Pinot Noir Chardonnay. And they'd look at that and go, really? <laughs> it's because we didn't plant the vineyard all at once. You know, we planted, we didn't want to make a 20 acre mistake. We wanted to make, we wanted to plant. And then as you do something, you always figure out a better way of doing it. And so we do a gob of problem solving, and that was kind of one of the things that we wanted to, to try, make sure that the decision that we made as to our spacing and how we were putting the trellis in and everything, those were correct. And we made some mistakes, but at least we didn't have to tra change the whole vineyard. You know, it's just the part that, that we'd done early, we changed that, like our, um, our, yeah. Uh. So then, and then uh, um, one of the early highlights was our 1990 Pinot Noir got best of show at the Oregon State Fair. Mm -hmm. and that got us off to a, a little bit of a, a quick start there. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah but, people noticed us a little but bit. But we went through, you know, uh, some uh, um, tough times then, a few years down the road. And mm -hmm. I think uh, things started to pick up again really in uh, probably about 98, somewhere in that range. Yeah, in 98, 99, and, yeah. and, and until 2000, 2007 was a really good year. It was one of our best years that we, that we had. We were selling a lot of wine, and then the economy sank. <laughs> so that was like... But since we brought, uh, since Kim came online, though, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we've been making, I, I think, some uh, terrific wines. Although some of our older wines have held up well, we've uh, opened up, uh, yeah, uh, some of the early '90 Pinots, and uh, uh, they'll be even our old that, Riesling that don't taste real good, <laughs> but there's some that are just outstanding. Mm -hmm. so. so it's been it's been very interesting, and you know, going through, you know, this, what do you what do you do for a closure? You know, what bottles do you use? And and we've gone through a lot of um, a lot of ups and downs with that. And um, you know, do you buy the heavyweight bottles or do you buy the lighter bottles? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what is what, what's more green, and all of those issues. And um, so, but but the marketing part of the business is the hardest part. Um, and and um, you just have to always try to think of something new to do. And it's, it's very difficult. And uh, people don't understand how hard that is. They think, oh, if I make good wine, everybody's gonna show up. And people open up their wine, we don't tell anybody. And then nobody shows up and they kind of can't figure out why people aren't here. Well, it's because you have to understand how to get them there. And it's not easy to do because the wine consuming public is a very small percentage of the public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, and then you keep, well, say 5% of people actually drink wine well, the people that actually buy a lot of wine are like 0.5%. You know, so you're talking about this very small segment of the population that are even interested in wine to start with, and then the ones that actually buy are even smaller. And so it's 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 very very difficult. Um, and um, I remember we would go to wine festivals, and they always wanted to have more wineries come. And it's like, but the piece of the pie goes down. Your, your piece of the pie gets smaller and smaller as you get more wineries in there, you know. And they never understood that. So, but, um, but yeah. Um, what, what did you do, to, especially in the early days, when there wasn't much other wine around you? What did you do to get people here? What did you do to get your name out there? Well, we, went, we felt going to the wine festivals was part of it mm -hmm. because, you know, people, you know, you get some people that drink wine. And, and we'd advertise a little bit in some of the wine, yeah. wine, yeah. the wine um, uh, magazines and uh, uh, things along yeah. that line. But I think we relied mostly just on uh, word of mouth from friends. Yeah, uh, word of mouth from people coming yeah. here. Uh, because when you go in the business, not all your friends are going to drink wine. You have to you you have to understand that people that used to be your, that used to be as friends with, if they don't drink wine, it's kind of like, well... Okay, that's not really our customer, is it? So, um, but it is, you end up making new friends with people that do like wine. And so that actually then people that like wine also like really good food. There's all of this stuff associated with it that is, that is really great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so that was, you know, we had to develop our own. And we'd moved away from where we lived before, so we were, we kind of had to develop a new group of friends here anyway. It was lovely being next to Elk Cove because that meant, meant there were two wineries up here that people could visit instead of just going all the way up the hill and having one winery. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that that was, uh, you know, we um, there were a very different winery from them as well. And so it provided a totally different experience for people, and, and they kind of liked that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
but um, yeah, um, see what else were, were we going to cover? I can't remember. Let me, let me take it back to the early days for a second. Yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. curious, I'm curious about you. You've 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 got some winemaking experience, although not necessarily a lot of grape wine making experience. Uh, I'm curious about the transition from kind of apartment wine or property wine of fruit into making trying to make a fine wine. And was there a difference in, in terms of the style and, and, the, and the, the work that went into it? Well, back at, at, the, at, the, uh, at, mm. at our Warren home, uh, we were actually one of the first uh, people in the area to put in a sport court. Mm. So we had a nice area where we could host dinners. Mm. And so we'd invite 10, 12 people over for a dinner and um, serve maybe six wines, three commercial and three of ours and have people vote on them. And mm -hmm. uh, so from that, we kind of uh, were able to mm -hmm. develop an idea of what we wanted to do. Uh, uh, we were uh, uh, probably making more wine than we should have. Uh, uh, Only 200 our, gallons. For our own use. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the learning process. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had to learn. And, and then the, uh, I think the other thing that uh, took us a while to learn was it was easier to make a better quality bigger quantity than a small quantity yeah so many things with a small quantity go go uh, uh, bad quickly whereas uh, with a larger quantity it gives you more time to uh, take care of that wine fix well, problems and so on and so forth yeah but the other thing is like the barrels are designed around you know 60 gallon barrels are the perfect size for wine and when you're an amateur winemaker, you buy five or ten gallon. Well, guess what? Your 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 oak is pretty strong. <laughs> you know, it's going to be overwhelming. You know, for the wine you're making, and and so you know, we figured that out. You are, you have a, a much larger group of yeast that you can you can purchase. There's a lot more products that you can purchase. Um, and um, I was trying to remember when Terry opened up. Um, the the wine place in McMinnville, ninety five or something. But we were buying from um, Scott Labs a lot, and we they would send us their brochure, and their brochure was almost like a textbook because it had research in it. Besides, it had this is all the new things we're doing, mm -hmm. and they had a lot of information about well, if you're making this wine, this is the yeast you you should use. And then every time that Barney had a an, a, um, an educational seminar or something, we tried to go to every one of them, because we knew we need to learn from people in Oregon. And we knew that that um, Oregon is very different from California, and going down to Davis wasn't going to really do it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we we so that was the value of that cool climate viticulture. I mean the cool climate viticulture seminar and the Oregon Wine Grape Growers Guide because it was written by people in Oregon, and um, had a lot of stuff in it. Mm -hmm. So it was it was very valuable. But in the early days, just uh, 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 when we were doing comparative tastings, you know, with ours versus mm -hmm. commercial. And then when we first went commercial, uh, just getting out to taste as many wines, whether people brought them uh, uh, to us to taste or... Uh, it, it, uh, early on, quite a few people would bring us different wines, mm -hmm. you know, to taste. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we really enjoy the wine from here or there mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, so, uh, you know, you kind of mm -hmm. uh, develop a taste for certain things and then you try to, you know, how can we how can we do this? Yeah. So and I think in our experience, um, uh, I, I think the night uh, uh, in Oregon, the uh, late eighties and early nineties, there were some wonderful wines made, but I think as a general rule, uh, if you if you tasted six wines, three probably had a flaw, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, as we were headed towards the two thousands, uh, uh, the year two thousand. Um, uh, I, I, I think the quality of the wine uh, really improved, mainly because I think uh, a better tasting with the uh, uh, with the labs that have op had opened, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and access to mm -hmm. a, a, a better equipment and, and uh, uh, newer yeast and all that. And experience of the winemakers yeah. over a period of years. So you, you, the more vintage you get under your belt, the more you understand what you need to do with a particular vin kind of vintage. Mm -hmm. Or you know, well, this, if this happens, then I have to do that. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's a natural maturation of any or, or any region, wine region, is the maturation of the winemaking. And today I find, I, I think most wines are good. Mm -hmm. There might be a style I don't like, but it's very mm -hmm. seldom I find a flaw anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good wine being made in Oregon, and it's really it's really exciting to see that. 
Uh, but I do feel, like Keith said, I think that having a lab in that lab in McMinnville ETS when they opened up, mm -hmm. that was a huge improvement. Mm -hmm. And the first they started out doing things that we were already doing, and then they started doing things we couldn't do because they had the right equipment. Mm -hmm. And one of those things is the um, is the the juice panel that they do during harvest because we can send that, they can actually come pick it up or we can take it in and by five o'clock, sometime after five o'clock that day we'll have results. It's amazing to think that you would have it that quickly. And then you can say, okay, I have the issue is that we have low nitrogen in our fruit, so we need to add nitrogen so that we have a healthy fermentation, and, but we don't, if we don't know what that level is, how are we gonna know how much to add? And so um, I think that is a, is a huge improvement in, in you know, what the Oregon wineries improved when they had that data, that information. Because before that, they'd have to send it way down to California and they wouldn't know for days. And it's just, you know, it's just uh, a huge, huge thing, I think. Mm -hmm. I think, to, to me, anyway, I thought, as a winemaker. And uh, Trudy mentioned uh, 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 we used to buy grapes from uh, Jim Layden as an amateur. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, 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 sometime in the winter, he would have a, um, a dinner and you present your wines from the year before. Yeah. Not, not the current year, but the year mm -hmm. before. And it, that was always fun because there'd be six, eight, ten of us there um, uh, with wines to taste. Mm -hmm. But one thing I always remember, his brother was Norman Layden, the pops conductor, mm -hmm. and he'd be there helping serve the food. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I remember too, we, we went there before we had even thought about in, buying this place, and Jeff Lammy was there. And he took one look at me and he said, Well, when are you going to open your winery? I'm sitting here going, What? <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty interesting. Right. You mentioned being in the, in the 50, 57, I think you said, 57th winery or 58th winery? When yeah, you, something winery. like that. Active, active 50, wineries, 50. yeah. Tell me, tell me what the industry looked like to you as you came into it, as you became aware of it, and then you joined into it. Obviously, you had a, you had a neighbor. Uh, besides mm -hmm. that, what else did you see of the industry? How did you get to know the people? Um, in well, they had uh, the OWA would have regular meetings, and we would go to them every time. We wanted to get to know the people in the industry, um, and and I really liked the what I call the founding fathers and how they kind of set everything up. And the the more I learned about what they did, the the more admiration I have for what they did. It was a good group. It was of a people. really good group of people. They wanted to cooperate yeah. with each other. Yeah. They understood that this is going to be the, the that the um, success of our industry is going to be if people cooperate Everybody with each other and share information. Else. You know, yeah, instead of um, uh, the business that I was in, which was uh, cutthroat. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we really like that idea. The fact that a lot of them are families. Mm -hmm. um, that was another thing. Uh, family businesses. Um, and and just the it, how interesting it was to make wine and you know the actual making of the wine and working with the grapes and and the actual what you went through to get the wine made and and how you think you're doing pretty good and all of a sudden oops that happened oh no what are we gonna do now kind of thing and um, and what we found is that, that that we were really good at tossing ideas back and forth and coming up to a solution and we think well we think well, this is the right solution and then we'd find out later we made the right order, the right decision there how did we do that I mean because we because we didn't know if we were making the right decision and we ended up making the right decision so so um, yeah that happened a lot to us so it's like well I guess we should be doing what we're doing <laughs> I'm curious about you you mentioned uh, planting incrementally and, and not wanting to make, like you say, a 20-acre mistake. What were some of the, 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 the early lessons you learned? What were some of the challenges or, or maybe mistakes you made early on that you had to kind of work through or, or fix uh, for future work? When we used to go uh, tasting, um, uh, one of the things that I always looked at and, and you know, just surmised in my own head was that, uh, you know, if that vineyard looks like it's laid out nicely, then I'm sure they're taking care of the wines. You know, probably no relation, but in my head there was. Mm -hmm. So that was important to me, that uh, uh, what, uh, if we go up above and look out over the vineyard, everything looks organized. It's all and lined up. That's that uh, uh, mm -hmm. was, a, was a deep challenge for us because we're on a hilly slo slopes that are, you know, difficult to get everything nice and straight. Mm -hmm. Um, but but that that was important. Well, we had a little bit of help though. And and uh, um, uh, also uh, um, 
we really weren't sure exactly what grapes to plant where, but I think overall we lucked out and put them and in have the, right, the right grapes in the, in the right, right places uh, uh, for the amount of sun they need, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Because we do have some grapes on west facing slopes, some on east facing slopes, and some uh, steep it, south slopes. So it's really hard to figure out because you don't you don't know what you're, if you're doing the right thing. Um, but fortunately, there was a gal that worked with Keith in in St. Helens whose son was an apprentice. Um, Surveyor. Surveyor. Mm -hmm. He came up and laid the whole vineyard out from one end to the other. It was really... Well, he, he just did the main... Well, I know, but I no. mean, he, he, we, he, he went, okay, this is, the, this is the line here. And so then we could take that line, and, and then Keith took um, a roll of wire, and every five feet he put a um, fishing... What do you call that fishing thing? Weight. Fishing yeah. weight. So that we didn't have to actually have a measurement... We, but we knew those were five feet apart. And he had, what, 300-foot roll, see? So that was pretty good. <laughs> and then we did, it, we did also have some smaller 100-foot um, rolls and 50-foot um, that we could, so we could go this way, you know, one yeah, way this way and one way that way. A little interesting aspect. Yeah. Uh, uh, me and Trudy uh, have, have planted, I think, at least 90% of it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, With I, shovels. I, I attribute 10% to friends. But <laughs> yeah. But we planted, I mean, we started out with shovels. Um, and then now when we plant, he's got an auger that he can kind of go, wink. It's so much easier. <laughs> you know. And, um, and we've also been very fortunate to have a crew that works in our vineyard that has worked in our vineyard. The family has worked in our vineyard since 89. Mm -hmm. And so we've, most of the time, we've had really good luck with getting them here when we needed them. Whenever we... When harvest rolled around, we, they would come first thing in the morning every time we needed them. You know, rarely would they say, no, we can't come that day, or would they say, well, we can come the next day. So um, it worked out really beautiful because the first day we ever made, we had got grapes in it. They came from Jim Layden's vineyard that was Miller Trugau. And you have this equipment, and there's no, nothing that tells you how to use it. They assume that you know how to use it. And so, and it said that this little press that we had, that you're supposed to put water in it, and it's supposed to be 50 pounds per square inch, the, the pressure coming out of your, we didn't have 50 pounds per square inch water, sorry. So that didn't work out so well. But then Keith decided, and then the problem was you'd put the water in, you'd press the grapes, then you'd take the water out, and there's water all over the place. It was just a mess. So Keith decided let's at some point I, was it the first year he decided mm -hmm. i think we're going to use an air and an, an, an air compressor huge difference mm -hmm. and um so it's things like that that we learned you know we found out that when we were pressing the grapes that we had to have a liner inside the press because if it got really really strong the grapes would shoot out from the bottom of the press and they'd go way up to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And you'd sit there and look, oh, there's grapes up there. <laughs> so we found that, yeah, if, if we had a little lining on the inside, they wouldn't be able to get out. So. <laughs> it's a good lesson to learn, I yeah, suppose. <laughs> yeah, and I think most people that have those kind of presses figured that out. <laughs> or learned from other people that told them you have to have linings. So. As, as, you, as you started uh, the business, did you have a vision for what you wanted it to be? Did you have a, a size in mind or a style in mind or was it just kind of build as you go? Did you have like a, an, an end goal? More of a... No, I think I would build as we go. Uh, 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 I, I see us um, getting a little bit larger than we are today, but, but I think we're almost where we want to be. Yeah, the thing is that, that you get, with the equipment that you have, you can only do so much. Mm -hmm. If you decide you want to get bigger, you have to buy all new equipment. And that stuff is not inexpensive. So, you know, you have to make a decision, do I want to continue on or just adjust what I'm making? You know, and, and so um, when we went into sparkling wine that we used to have like two or three hundred cases of Chardonnay every year, we have a hundred this year. A mm -hmm. hundred in most years. Because we uh, have taken that and put that into the brute. So, you know, there's been a lot of product adjustments. There's been a lot of, you know, you know, the labels, um, having different labels, you know, redesigning all the time and, and trying to get something that might work better. You, it's, and that's just a, another zoo, really, mm -hmm. 
you know, because one person will like one label, the other person thinks it's ugly. You know, it's just, you can't win. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, just a lot of, really a lot of learning all the time. It was never really very dull. And of course, you're raising a family here as, as well. So mm -hmm. tell me about raising a family while, while undergoing this project and then the sort of transition as the family comes back into the business. Yeah. I, I think the best story is, uh, is Kim. Mm -hmm. Kim, I think, just thought we worked too hard and didn't really want anything to do with the vineyard or winery when she was going to school here. She would just go up to the house yeah. during harvest and stay there. But, uh, but uh, Kim but, and Mickey and Becky would come down. Then that, uh, uh, after some college time, she uh, 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 went to work for another winery uh, in the taste room and then uh, uh, eventually uh, uh, helping out in the winery and then... Uh, taking class at Chemeketa, which when Barney the, was there, which was like, yes! Yeah, got, so went, got her degree there and now mm -hmm. she loves everything we do here. <laughs> so she had, it just interested her, you I'm know. Very, very proud of uh, how she's come along. Yeah. And then our youngest, Becky, was always interested in what was going on here. And uh, uh, what always surprised us was uh, some different type of animal or whatever, a snake or a <laughs> bunny or a chicken or a squirrel with a purple tail or something. You know. <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 she went to college and then... Uh, 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 she went to Portland State and graduated in business. business. in Forest Grove, so she had the wine shop in Forest Grove for, uh, for five years. Uh, five years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, decided she didn't, didn't want to work the late nights anymore, so uh, uh, she's taken over the the office part now. So yeah, the, and then my son is uh, into computers, and and uh, he lives in Vancouver. So his help is uh, when we need upgrades. <laughs> A helpful skill to have. Yes. Yes, he always was into computers, so that was really nice. He could end up being so successful in what he's doing. So we're happy for him. I'm curious about, it's always interesting for us when you talk about a, sec, a first and second generation. You, you, this is your, your dream. You, got, you guys start this. This is all your blood, sweat, and tears and all your shovel digging. And uh, as the transition happens, how does that, how, how do you work on, how do you let go? How, how do you cede some of that control and, and bring people on and, well, and, and keep the vision going? Well, it's good. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way I look at it. Uh, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, sometimes when that happens, things don't always go out, turn out good. But uh, like I said, I think the wines are better today than they were, were 10 years ago. And, and we have, an, uh, I, I think, overall a nicer selection. So we, we, we've got something for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we, that's, we've always had a variety of wines. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that it bodes well because people start in their wine tasting experience at different areas, sometimes people will, oh, I just like Cabernet, I like Big Reds, and then people, some people say, I just like Sweet, mm -hmm. you know. And then they'll realize, well, I like Miller Turgot to start with, but your Chardonnay kind of appeals to me now. And, and then they'll go into the, the, the Pinot, and some people will get tired of the Big Reds and come back to Pinot. And so you have this, you know, there are people that are kind of fluid. Some people are like, I like Sweet, that's what I always like, period. But there are people that realize it's a journey. You're getting on a road and it has all these forks, you don't know where it's going to go, you know. And that's really, um, that's really something that, that feeds right into what we're doing because we have that variety for people. But it's also rewarding to know that there are some people that have been customers of ours since we opened that were still walking through the door. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, it is really cool. So, uh, uh, obviously, the industry's grown significantly in every way since you started. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to size, what, what are the other what, is, what are the biggest changes you've seen in, in Oregon wine uh, since you since you got going in it in '84? When we were first uh, open in '84, we were always no, glad to see '90 90. or, or 90 90. When we first open. Yeah, right. it was good to see uh, uh, somebody from Washington or California, you know. And then pretty soon we, you know, a few years down the road, you start seeing people from other areas and now we see people from all over the world I think that's the biggest change uh, um, uh, the bigger the industry the more draw we bring from you know people all over so I, I think it's I was a little, a little concerned you know when we uh, started topping maybe 300 wine we said how are we gonna you know sell all this wine you know mm -hmm. but uh, uh, yeah, demand now 
all over. Yeah, the the thing. It's amazing. Uh, some of our good customers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Texas, um, uh, Louisiana. You know, it's uh, just mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, we have. Um, and um, then the more yeah, people that uh, 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 order wine from from us that way, um, uh, sometime when they're out this way, they stop in and say, "Hey, we knew uh, such and such and enjoyed the wine, so we thought we'd come out and taste." And, mm -hmm. You know, so you, you know you get new customers. Mm -hmm. There's there's always different avenues to, uh, to explore. But also in Oregon, I think in every new wine region, they, that the wineries have to train their 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 clientele. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing that down in California for a really long time. And we are relatively new. And so you have to understand, you have to tr train your clientele to understand how to appreciate wine. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they start getting into, like, the, like, how do you grow the grapes and how do you make the wine? And they kind of get interested in all that. So we have actually uh, come up with, uh, and Kim and Becky kind of came up with this Kramer University concept where we, we do, um, and that's why the TV's over here, is, is to, to have um, events that are around teaching the, cli the clientele different things. Mm -hmm. And we've had some really fun things, like um, Kim, Kim did one thing on uh, sparkling wine and the different levels of sugar you can add. And, and, you know, and, uh, and that's kind of interesting to see how much a wine changes with just a little bit of sugar difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and things like that, that people really soak it up. You know, we do a, in every March, we do a um, taste or a, a smell sniff test type thing. We'll take a red wine and a white wine and have all of the different fruits and different smells that could be for each wine. And uh, people just come in and they just kind of go around the table in a circle and smell, they taste the wine and they smell these different things and see if they can identify those in the wine. And um, that's something that's been very popular with a lot of people. Um, because that's something that not a lot of people do. And, mm -hmm. and we do fresh stuff too. We'll do like a fresh strawberry or a fresh raspberry or you know, a piece of apple cut in half, you know, um, lemon, lime, all those things. So it's a really good thing to do. As you look to the future for Kramer, what, are you, what do you see? What do you, what do you, what do you hope for? And, and what, do you, what do you kind of see coming in the next iteration of, of Kramer Vineyards? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to sell a whole lot more sparkling. <laughs> I, <laughs> it takes a long time for people to realize that you have changed your product mix, and and to for people to 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 go, oh yeah, they have sparkling. Um, it, it it's it's take, taken us a while, um, and more and more as time goes on, we're getting that recognition. But it really is a long term thing, and I know everybody that's gotten into it has has you know, been through kind of a hard period where you kind of like, oh, should I have made that decision to do this um, because of all of the costs involved with it. Um, but that was the beauty of the carbonated stuff because we make it 65 gallon lots and we can turn around and sell it right away. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do any storage. Mm -hmm. It's the previous vintage, you know, pretty much. It's, uh, it, you go through it a lot quicker and it's a much cheaper process. It's only a five day process as far as getting the bubbles in. It's amazing. So, you know, whereas the method challenge was is much more complicated than that and, and, and a lot more difficult. And, um, and it's, it's a lot harder. But yeah, I think, I think that there's not that many people that want to do sparkling and so I think that's probably a, kind of one of our niches there that people... Yeah, probably a little more sparkling, but uh, I'd like to get our, 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 our case production up just a little bit more and then, uh, um, you know, maintaining the quality. Yeah, maintain the quality, always, always. It's always. You're always trying to make a better wine, no question about it, regardless. So. Last, last, last question for you, I have here. Um, you guys obviously married a long time, been business partners a long time. 50, 50 years. 50 years, congratulations in advance. <laughs> Tell me about the secret to success, uh, being, being married and business partners and working on, on a project like this together for so long. Well, I think we have to respect each other's brains. Um, and, and also, you know, I think differently than he does. And I don't know how many times he's been struggling with something and I will say, well, all you have to do is that. And he goes, oh. And then I'm struggling with something and he goes to me, well, all you have to do is that. 
And, and so I think that you have to understand that people think different ways and you have to respect that and you have to, have to sometimes you have to sleep on stuff, you have something that you yeah, just bugging you. If there's something that bugs us. You, you know, just have to sleep on it sometimes. Yeah. And then, you know, you kind of go. Well, you're, For some reason the answer comes to me. Yeah. It does. It's a thing, you know. You know I have a trouble with a piece of equipment, you know. I yes, and why am I having so much trouble with that? Uh, yeah. Then I have a dream about it and then it comes to me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a good skill to have. I need a skill like that. Yeah, yeah. So, but any, anyway, yeah, I, you know, I think it's a, a, a give and take, absolutely. So, seems like I give more than I take. <laughs> good secret to success there. Mm -hmm. That's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? There was one thing I was thinking about, you know, as you're talking about the change of the industry. Because mm -hmm. when we started out, the, the winers weren't very big, and they did get bigger. Mm -hmm. And we had new people come in that were big. You know, the Willamette Valley Vineyards be coming on board. Mm -hmm. um, King Estate was a big thing. Mm -hmm. And the reason with that was that up until King Estate came on board, most of the wineries were buying on a handshake their, their grapes. Mm -hmm. King Estate came in and said, we will pay pay you within like, I don't know, a week or 10 days of delivery and here sign on the dotted line. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of wineries had to adjust what they were doing because King Estate took some of those that fruit away from them. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of made everybody realize this is a business we have to act in a business manner. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, that was it was that's one of those growing pain things that happens with a with an industry is is that this happens and you kind of go, oh well, we have to change what we're doing now. And, um, you know, and the same thing with the COVID-19 thing, we're gonna change what we have to change what we're doing. And it's, it's something that, that happens and you just have to have to adapt. Mm -hmm. and you can't fight it. Yeah, and then another thing, in the vineyards as well, uh, 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 we started planting on, on 10 and nine foot uh, rows Mainly because John Deere. I mean, uh, it, the tractor has to fit down it, the row. It was seventy-two inch uh, tractor. Yeah. Uh, at that time, so the rows had to be a little further apart, and then uh, we started seeing smaller tractors there in the late '80s and uh, early '90s, mm -hmm. and, and now uh, um, there's a lot of small tractors that are been your that are quite as quite so, as wide. So that uh, you can plant rows. Um, if I was to plant a the vineyard over, uh, I I would do four foot between the plants and eight foot between the rows. And uh, we see some that are even down to six foot, but boy, six foot makes a difference. You run into the plants then. You know, you're going to damage them because you just, you can't be that perfect a driver. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. You know, because we had enough, of, we had tractor blight and we had deer blight and we had dog blight and we had all sorts of blights, you know, that was like, well, guess what? And some of the plants would come right back. It's just unbelievable. I wrote, wow, I went over that plant and it's still growing. <laughs> So you have to respect the plants are amazing. They respond. Every time you go out and you prune them, they respond to what you do. Even though the wine industry has its ups and downs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it's been a wonderful ride as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would do it again. Yeah, it's really, it's really fun because people come in and they, they, they really feed on our excitement mm -hmm. and our focus and, you know, with it. And, and I think that's part of it is for them to meet you. And most of the time when people come to our taste room, they meet, run into a family member. And now we have four that are here. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to a lot of places, you don't run into anybody that's an owner. You run into, and then, but it takes somebody that, that is able to work with the general public. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it takes a special skill to do that. And so if you have a winery and you're not good with that, you do have to hire somebody to be your, your face person because you know, it's not gonna be a good thing if you don't. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's, people really like the fact they come here and they see us. Mm -hmm. We are actually here. And I'm in my office working. I don't really have any responsibility on the taste room anymore, but People will come in and say, "Is Trudy there? Is Trudy here?" Because I've been the face for so long. And but Kim and Becky are coming in, and people are accepting them very, very nicely. And and um, Kim is in particular likes to talk about the winemaking with people, and 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 people really appreciate that the winemaker is willing to talk to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with people that is really special, I think. And Kim and Becky know the new technology. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, it used to be advertising. Now it's online everything. And, you know, that was a huge change for, for everybody. Uh, going to doing emails instead of, you know, uh, send, sending stuff out in the mail. You know, it's just like, it's just an amazing difference. And that then also trying to advertise, you know, not no longer doing ads in papers and doing it, you know, is this ad doing us any good? You know, and, and well, Kim says, well, again, on Facebook, and guess what? We had all these people show up that had never been here before. So, you know, things like that are trying to, it's, it's always going to be hard to figure out how to get people here. Um, but you have to be willing to try all these things and, and experiment and move forward. Well, thank you both so much mm -hmm. for sharing your time with us today, sharing your stories. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Okay.